Gigabyte's Aorus Z270X Gaming 7 motherboard is the first of three on our bench for review. Having housed the Intel i7-7700K for the past week or two, we'll next be looking at the MSI Gaming Pro Carbon and MSI Tomahawk Z270 boards and hope to soon expand into some H and B250 chipset looks. For today, it's the Gaming 7 from Gigabyte, for which we've recruited Buildzoid for overclocking analysis. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by Thermaltake and their $100 Core P3 chassis. The P3 can be wall mounted and makes for a unique, easy access test bench for convenient hardware swapping. Learn more at the link below. We've already reviewed the Intel i7-7700K KV Lake CPU in another video and article, which we'll link below if you haven't seen that yet. But now we're going to focus on the chipsets, at least for a little bit anyway. Z270 is the one on the table here and that is obviously replacing Z170. The only major differences between these other than Intel Optane support is that there's expanded HSIO lanes available on the Z270 platform. Here's a look at the block diagram for Z270. We'll throw Z170 up on the screen for reference. As you can see, the biggest difference is that Intel now allows for USA ports. More importantly, Intel has added four HSIO lanes to the chipset, allowing now for a maximum total of 30 high-speed I.O. devices. We've explained this a few times before, but the lanes that I'm talking about can be shared with things like Gigabit Ethernet, USB 3.0, and other high-speed I.O. devices, as the name would suggest. And this also includes the capability by motherboard manufacturers and, to some extent, Intel to peel off lanes for additional PCIe devices, up to a cluster, so to speak, of by 4 so you can pull off out of the HSIO lanes in the chipset sets of four lanes that go to PCIe, and that's not necessarily a hard PCIe slot. It can also be M.2 devices and things that are enabled by PCIe lanes, but might not actually be a traditional PCIe slot. So this means that with the by 4 limitation, and this is not new for KB Lake, this is old news at this point, with the by 4 limitation, you're generally not using that to add more GPUs. This is a common misconception where people think that the chipset dictates their GPU lane availability. And to some extent that is true or possible anyway, but it's mostly the CPU that is leveraged for those lanes for the GPU. So you pull off four, if you plug in a GPU, you're basically limited to a by four setup. And with multi GPU configurations, that means basically crossfire because Nvidia SLI wants by eight. More realistically, you're using these lanes for things like SSDs that live on PCIe slots, either through AICs or through M.2 devices. The PCIe lanes through the chipset have now increased to 24 3.0, up from 20 on Z170, and H270 also sees an increase in total PCIe lanes and HSIO lanes. Regardless, we've already broken down the chipset differences in our Intel KB Lake review and preceding chipset differences content. So you can check that out in the link in the description below for more information. Getting back to the motherboard review at hand, Gigabyte's board on the table here is at an MSRP of $240. So that puts it up in competition with some ROG boards. It's certainly one of the more expensive ones that will be available. And the other ones we're looking at, like the Gaming Pro Carbon, fall closer to the $160, $170 price point. So that's what you're interested in, stay tuned for the coverage after CES, which we'll be at this week. So for this board, the Aorus badge means that it is equipped with, of course, RGB LEDs. That has been the thing for the last year and still is. So those are on here. There are RGB LED arrays between the RAM slots, if that's your thing. There's RGB LEDs pretty much everywhere. Uh, the, v the core VRM, the PCIe slots below them, there are a couple of LEDs, and uh, RAM, and then some of the shielding over here, the IO shields, which you can remove if you prefer. For what it's worth, there's also a laser etched acrylic housing thing on the right side of the board that can be illuminated and you can swap it out if you want to laser etch your own option instead. Getting back to more mission critical things, board layout includes multi BIOS with two different firmware chips, a toggle switch bounces between them as you'd expect, and additional cap switch toggles can be used to regulate gain of audio output. Moving along the board, there are buttons present for power, overclock application, and eco mode. The latter two do require Gigabyte's easy OC software to use, so it's not just going to work even though they'll light up. And eco mode doesn't really seem to do a whole lot. It doesn't really reduce power, at least any meaningful amount, but Gigabyte's got issues with voltage and power draw anyway, and we'll get to that in a moment. Troubleshooting features include additional LEDs with legends for diagnostics, that's a huge plus, alongside the expected seven segment display, also a valuable addition. As for the VRM design and layout, we spoke to Buildzoid of actually hardcore overclocking about this, and he has a separate video for us going up on this channel, so subscribe for that, which will have a full analysis of the VRM and some of the overclocking capabilities. 
But I've got the basics for you here. I worked with Bill Doit to do some basic resistance probing on the motherboard so we could at least figure out what we think is an 8 plus 3 VRM. So it's 8 plus 3 phases, 8 for the core, and then 3 for the GPU. The basics are that the 8 plus 3 setup appears to be doing some sort of trickery. Our current theories are that Gigabyte is either switching on two phases at a time or is using something like a doubler to assist in its setup. VCCSA and VCCIO are using minor VRMs located elsewhere on the board. And this, as far as the core VRM goes, isn't a real eight phase. It also doesn't really matter for Skylake and Kaby Lake, at least for most users. And Kaby Lake is basically Skylake, just with taller fin height and widened gate pitch. Unless venturing into more extreme overclocking territory, at which point you may be considering a different motherboard anyway, most overclocking endeavors will do just fine with this eight plus three setup. Regardless, at 125C, the VRM should handle well over 200 amps on vCore with the GPU VRM capable of handling 80 amps and up at 125C. And this is assuming a pretty safe 500 kilohertz switching frequency, so we're giving it a bit of an assumption there, but most boards are in the 200 to 300 kilohertz range, so adjust as according to those changes. I mentioned voltage issues earlier, and that's what we're talking about now. So KB Lake, in our review of the 7700K, it's pretty easy to demonstrate that between two different motherboards, in this case the Gaming 7 here and the Gaming Pro Carbon from MSI, we were seeing drastically different temperatures. This happens because of the voltage configuration. In theory, VID is supposed to be read off of the CPU, so the CPU says I need this much voltage and the motherboard complies, with auto settings anyway. Uh, and what's happening is what appears to be a gigabyte BIOS side issue, which could be resolved through a firmware update but is, at least in this version of the board, a problem. We're reading voltages way more than what's necessary to operate at stock settings. This is something we've been communicating with Intel and Gigabyte, but haven't yet received a resolution. Here's a reprint of our charts used in the 7700K review. Gigabyte with auto settings and an otherwise out-of-box configuration is pushing at times 1.404 volts to the CPU during load, and this is absolutely unnecessary. That's with a 4.5 gigahertz clock rate. We're able to sustain the same 4.5 clock by manually tuning vCore to around 1.18 volts, and that's without any instability issues, demonstrating that Gigabyte's voltage frequency table is definitely overambitious in what it's supplying to the core. What's the downside of this? Well, it's temperature, as you probably guessed. Running an unnecessarily high voltage for an auto-configured, out-of-box, fresh-from-factory motherboard on the 7700K is resulting in, again, a 1.4 volts throughput, and that means that we're getting temperatures of something like 94C when this board's competitor, at least a cheaper competitor, is performing about 12 Celsius cooler. And that's because of the unnecessary voltage, even though the CPU remains stable in either state. And this is, just to reiterate, with a Kraken X62 CLC. This is one of the best closed loop coolers on the market. It's $160. And further, it's with that cooler using both 140mm fans, a 280mm rad, at full RPM, so that's 1800 RPM, with the pump also at max RPM, and the temperatures on this board are still 94C with the out-of-box settings. And that's on an open-air bench, just to further <laughs> drive it in, how big of an issue this is. So if you buy the board and you don't think to check voltage, which if you're running auto, why would you, then what could happen is you're running into thermal throttle issues. It probably won't damage your CPU. Intel has protections in place for that, but you will definitely see clock reductions, and we saw them and talked about them in the Intel review of the 7700K. So, open air bench with an ambient of about 20C, maybe 22, and a $160 closed loop liquid cooler with a, an approaching unbearable R fan RPM we're getting 94C, so that's not good. Hopefully Gigabyte fixes it. It can be resolved through BIOS updates, and of course it can be resolved by user input. You can go in, manually set the voltage to something like 1.275 if you want it to be at the high end, or maybe 1.2, and probably be fine. It's very easy to check stability. If it's not stable, then just increase it slightly, but not to the 1.4 that Gigabyte's running. And just again for perspective, MSI's board that we have tested so far is sitting at around 1.32 volts for the same auto settings where Gigabyte was doing about 1.4. That's for 4.2 to 4.5 gigahertz on the clock. We're also pushing more wattage to the CPU as a result of Gigabyte's configuration. Big surprise there. So you're drawing more power and of course driving more heat. That lands the CPU at 133 to 138 watts at the high end where MSI's lower vCore auto settings land us at around 100 watts with maximally 111 watts 
that's much lower, obviously. If we look again at temperatures and voltages, we are able to get the CPU down to a way more acceptable 70C with a manually adjusted voltage of about 1.88 to 1.28 volts depending on what the CPU wanted at the time. So to recap, that's a 24C reduction in temperatures just by us going in there and changing the voltage, which is trivial, and hopefully Gigabyte does soon for their BIOS because the table is clearly referencing a much higher number than is necessary. Now the good news here is that even when overclocking using their auto OC, which they call CPU upgrade, to so something like five gigahertz, which is trivial with KB Lake, at least the 7700K, we're still seeing the same voltage. So uh, it's not, doing something like 1.7 volts or anything insane like that. It's still sticking around 1.4. So at least there's that, but it's not a great uh, piece of news overall. So it is easily resolved though. You could fix it or Gigabyte could, but at $240, it's not something that you should have to worry about. Let's move on to UEFI and look at something that Gigabyte does a bit better than the V core settings. The options overall are what you'd expect from a Gigabyte motherboard. Any owner of a high-end or moderately high-end Z170 or Z97 Gigabyte board will recognize UEFI overall and its options. There are a few newer options here. AVX tuning for overclocking is a nice addition for more extreme overclockers, as is the presence of VCC PLL overclocking for users of LN2. Gigabyte has also resolved issues with PWM not working properly. Unlike some previous Gigabyte motherboards, the Z270X Gaming 7 actually uses a PWM signal rather than direct voltage control for fan speed adjustment. This is important for users of maglev fans or fan splitter hubs, so good on Gigabyte for finally fixing that. Speaking of fans, the board does make abundant use of full PWM 4-pin headers, which is always nice to see. And we can also appreciate that there's support for upwards of 2 amps throughput on the hybrid fan headers with OCP available. There are a few additional pinouts that are designated as pump headers on the board and in BIOS that's useful for isolating cooling solutions by label. And then while it was on the bench, Gigabyte gave us a pre-production BIOS fix that resolves some memory overclocking. So achieving 3200 MHz XMP is really not a problem with the Z270 board. It supports it completely. To disclose some preferences here, because it does matter for this section, I'm a fan of the older school approach to BIOS where you use a keyboard and no mouse. And then ideally you give me something without a bunch of graphics and useless speedometers and things like that because I just want the options in a tree listing that you can arrow through and hit enter to modify. To that end, Gigabyte has done well. This does not have the insane amount of graphics, knobs, speedometers, and car references that, for example, MSI's BIOS almost embarrassingly uses, despite being good BIOS overall. It's just kind of not necessary. So Gigabyte doesn't do all of that. It does have some issues with the mouse and to quote Bill Zoid, if you're gonna have a mouse in there, at least make sure it works. Gigabyte's mouse works, but it feels like it's stuck on an XY grid sometimes where it won't quite do diagonal movement unless you whip it across the desk. So that could be improved on. Again, thankfully, this is something that can be improved on through a BIOS update. It's not a hardware level issue, just like the V Core one is probably not a hardware level issue. The Gigabyte Z270X RS Gaming 7 motherboard is acceptable, I guess. If you fix the V Core issues, it's not bad. And that's the major point of concern. So all these other things, really in the face of the vCore, it's pretty much irrelevant. Once that's fixed, this board will be much easier to recommend. I do have a few caveats I'll mention in a second, but the majority of system builders who buy something like this, assemble a system, are probably not going to check vCore if they're running out of box settings for the CPU or the motherboard. And even if you do some lightweight overclocking, it's still pushing more voltage than is necessary at times, depending on the clock rate. So that should be resolved. There is a temperature delta that we've measured between our samples and that can vary by sample based on the soldering and the uh, thermal paste application. But our samples show about a six to seven C delta between Skylake and KB Lake. And that is not terrible, but it's exacerbated by the Gigabyte V-Core, which creates more like a 20 C delta between its competitors. So I'd like to see that fixed. That's why I've spent so much time talking about it today. Uh, the price for the motherboard, $240 is a bit ambitious, I think. I would personally not be paying more than like $170, $180 for this, max $200, but probably $180 is where, uh, where I would invest my money. And uh, the LEDs, if you really like them, I guess the board has them, but the problem is everyone has them now. So even at the $165 price point, if that's what you care about and you don't really need any other features, you could get it for cheaper and it'd look basically just as good. So it's a tough selling point. 240 bucks is drifting towards something like some low end entry level ROG boards. And those generally have better options for you if you're an overclocker.
If not, then get something cheaper. And for any kind of extreme overclocking, generally you will want, as we've learned from speaking with Buildzoid, something like an ROG board, an X Power board, something like that from MSI or ASUS. And we might look at those later. For now, this is over ambitious. The LEDs are okay, but do not make up the cost. And Gigabyte at least has done well with forward thinking on liquid cooling. This board has the pump headers, which aren't really that special, but they do label it pump, so that's nice. And then their other boards have the EK water blocks connectors, which is also good forward thinking. So they've done some things well. It's just not enough. Hopefully the price drops. If not, we might be looking at other boards that are cheaper from Gigabyte in the future. We'll have the Gaming Pro Carbon up soon. So subscribe for that content. Links in the description below for more information. As always, Patreon link in the post-roll video if you want to help us out directly. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.